one. Hello, everybody. Seattle Mike, I am here with Brent uh, Freya, MMA um, expert, former professional fighter, uh, high school teacher uh, out of Canada, fought some in the United States, Korea, Japan. Uh, he's been all over and he's known by the professor. <laughs> I, I don't love that nickname, but a, a friend of mine, gave, gave, I, we were at an event with, where they basically said, if you don't get a nickname on your sheet, we're going to give one to you. And so <laughs> my, my friend gave, who is also fighting, gave that to me. He thought it was hilarious that I was an English teacher and also fighting professionally. So, <laughs> uh, Ah, that's funny. Okay. Yeah. I just seen it. I, I was on Sure Dog. So I seen it said the professor. So yeah. Yeah. So you, you came up in a time in, in MMA, though, when I think of it as it's probably like the height of popularity, like 2008, because uh, I, I remember going to UFC 102 in Portland, and it's like, man, not only was the whole stadium, it's like the whole city, I swear, had a tap out shirt on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the probably definitely some of the, the height of some of the biggest stars around that time um some some of the best and worst parts of the sport i think all come from that time <laughs> yeah um I, I was talking to our uh, common friend ian uh today and it's like you know what what should i ask brent about what should i talk to him about he goes ask him about some of the crazy things that went on uh be behind the scene uh before the fights so do you, you have any stories like that yeah well um like we were talking right, you know, before we started recording here, I fought a lot in Michigan and Wisconsin, kind of around the Midwest, um, before there was any athletic commissions. And it was, you know, we talk about the Wild West days and it, some of the stuff that went on was just at, like absolutely crazy. And, and as a coach now, I mean, now everything is regulated and which is good. I'm, I'm, part of my job as a coach is to having been through some of the crazy stuff. I, I see it as having, making sure our fighters and athletes don't get put in those situations, which are sketchy to be generous, you know? So, I mean, like one of the first places I ever fought the ring or no, not the ring, the cage was framed with two by fours. Oh, wow. Um, it had cha galvanized chain link fence. So no like rubber coated. So you know, I would cut you up. It was the, the cage floor was literally um, like plywood sheets with the red and blue puzzle mats on top of it. I know, you know, those like, Oh yeah. You can get yeah. them on Amazon. You can get enough for your garage for like 50 bucks. Yeah. And, and I remember, <laughs> it's funny. I actually heard Chelsea on and tell a very similar story, but uh, I was fighting at this amateur event in Michigan. It was in a high school gym in a little city called Alpena, Michigan. And I picked the guy up in a double A and I turned him upside down and dropped him on the kind of like the back of his shoulder blades. And uh, we broke the floor. We broke the cage floor. Oh, wow. And uh, so he, um, he was kind of stuck in there. And then I think we kind of like, no, you know, wasn't, there was no break in the action, but we just kind of stopped and kind of like, I was on top of him. We kind of like shuffled our way out of the hole and restarted inside control. And I ended up submitting him right there. So it never got in the way of the fight, but then they had to pause the whole of <laughs> pause, the whole event and, uh, run out to the hardware store and get another sheet of plywood <laughs> luckily it was only puzzle mask because they pulled it up and put it down but yeah i've seen and then you know i've been in the change room when i was done fighting and the promoter would come back and say hey anybody want to fight again or anybody want to like just rent no rules nothing you never you never knew what was going to happen at the rules meeting what people were going to say what they would we would all, almost always guarantee that they would drop some crazy new rule on you um, specific to their promotion, like at any given time. So, so, so just so much crazy stuff that I saw go on in those days. Um, yeah. What, what would be an, an example, I guess, or some examples of some of the crazy rules? Um, <laughs> well, this one, this one wasn't actually me, but they were talking about whether you had to wear a cup or not. And um which obviously should be mandatory. And I remember at one, at one event there, the one guy was like, oh, I've never trained with one. I'm uncomfortable using it. And the promoters were just like, well, yeah, whatever. If you don't want to, you don't have to, I guess. I was like, <laughs> okay. And um, yeah, 
similarly, again, this one, that one I was there for. Another one a friend of mine told, but it was fighting at a same, same kind of event in Minnesota, I think, where they were talking about, you know, making sure that you've got your mouth guard on your way to the cage, which, you know, in the, in the moment, sometimes people forget and the cornermen should be there to, to do that. But uh, I remember them saying, we're not letting you in the cage without a mouth guard anymore. In, implying, that we, <laughs> implying that we did but then the funny part was that um a guy at the back who you know dressed in cut off jeans and a tank top probably rolled up pack of smokes under his warm-up shirt he said well what if you don't have any teeth and he pulled his teeth out and, <laughs> and the promoter said well i i guess you don't have to wear one <laughs> so it's yeah yeah, you think it could still damage your gums or something? It still, still seems like a good idea. I think I would probably try to wear one, but uh, you know, <laughs> preventing head trauma is pretty high on my priority list. So, <laughs> yeah, as it, as it should be. Yeah. Um, so, did you ever take up that take their offer on any of those multiple fights in a night? Um, not actual two MMA fights, but one one time I did fight. Um, I fought and I won fairly quickly, no damage felt fine. Um, and then the promoter came back afterwards and said, uh, I think I'd probably already had a couple of drinks, probably already had a couple of beers. <laughs> as, as, as you do after, uh, you know, uh, uh, you've trained hard and you've not had any drinks or you've been eating healthy and all that stuff. Yeah. So I had a couple of drinks with my friends who came to watch and, um, the promoter came back. I think he found me actually in the crowd and said, Hey, we had somebody drop out um this guy you know he's a young guy he was gonna fight another young guy probably won't do an MMA fight but how would you feel about doing just a grappling match in the cage with him and I so I said sure and I put my beer down and hopped back in the cage <laughs> so, so I haven't actually fought I have never actually fought twice in a night but I did I did do an MMA fight and a, and a grappling match later so so, that, that, so I was literally holding my beer yeah yeah exactly for sure yeah, I think that was probably my only hesitation. I was like, a grappling match, what could go wrong? And I was like, uh, but yeah. <laughs> but uh, that, that actually is something that I never got to do that was kind of on my bucket list. I would have loved to do a, a tournament, like a one night tournament, like a four or eight man tournament or something like they used to do. But those uh, just never really, never popped up, never happened for me, unfortunately. Yeah, I, I I don't think the commissions are too fond of those. Probably, mm -hmm. probably for good reason. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. It, back in those days, they they for sure could have done it because they were doing whatever they wanted. But um, what it would have been a I think a fun thing to do. I would have liked to. I would have enjoyed the challenge of doing it for sure. So I I did not realize how much of a wild wild west I guess it was by by that time because when you started fighting, this is three years after Ultimate Fighter. Yeah. Yeah, I think, and I think just part of it was that Midwest scene was maybe a little behind some of the bigger jurisdictions as well. So Michigan was late to get, um, to get an, you know, a government recognized athletic commission. So I think that was a big part of it as, as well. They were just kind of a little bit behind. I just, just another crazy one that popped into my head, um, uh, talking about like there was no medicals usually right like no blood yeah. work you didn't have to do blood work you didn't have to be medically certified there was you you know if there was a doctor mm -hmm. on scene you were lucky it was usually ems but i one time i remember um i'm not going to name this organization they don't exist anymore i don't think but uh, now that i say it i think all three of the stories i've told are all from the same organization but um a teammate of mine knocked a guy out cold with a head kick and it probably still to this day and i've seen you know, hundreds and hundreds, maybe a thousand live fights, cornering and being at events and stuff. Still to this day, this one of the scariest knockouts I've seen. It was one of those ones where he's your teammate. So you cheer at first and then you're like, oh, uh oh, ooh, that looks really bad. Kind of the, one of those. And so the, I remember the medical person came in who we assumed was a doctor or something. And they, they came in and um, what the, they weren't like, they weren't putting the person in the recovery position. They weren't, they just weren't handling it well. And we've kind of, some of us were in the cage with our teammate and somebody's like, what are you doing? What are you doing? And the, the girl said, well, I don't know. I'm just a massage therapist. Oh, wow. So they didn't even have a real, like any real medical staff there that, that I remember that was the one where I was like, 
okay, this is this is getting ridiculous. This is not safe. Let's let's try to hook up with some more legit organizations. So eventually we did, and that that was helpful. Yeah, that's that's pretty crazy. Um, I've heard of guys, you know, not getting paid and stuff too. Your promoters walking out on them. Did you ever run into any of that kind of situation? Yeah, yeah. Unfortunately, in our area, there was a there was a local promoter who. Um, We've been lucky to have some good local promoters or like in our regional promoters, I guess, not necessarily local, but yeah. uh, there was one guy who had started off working with his, with a, a pretty well-known and pretty well-respected promoter. And then he kind of decided to try and go off on his own. There was some kind of falling out there. And, uh, and I remember thinking, oh, this guy doesn't, he doesn't have the chops to run a show on his own. I don't think this yeah. is going to go well. And we luckily we didn't put anybody on his show, but sure enough, after the first show, he didn't pay the casino. He didn't pay his staff. He didn't pay the fighters. He got, oh, there were some char charges levied against him. And, and I, I did feel really bad for the fighters and staff who did it. Cause a lot of the staff, um, you know, in one area, there's only so many people who know how to run a show. So it's the same staff who work for multiple promotions and lots of friends and people that I knew and had worked with a lot. Um, so I felt bad for them. Um, at the same time, I, I, I was saying, I hate to tell you, say I told you so, <laughs> Yeah, but, but I, but I definitely told people so. so. Yeah. It's, it, it's too bad. That kind of stuff's out there, but, um, do you ever have a, your high school teacher? Uh, did you ever have any, like a principal or somebody be like, Hey, uh, you're doing this cage fighting. Anybody ever uncomfortable with that? Um, I was, I was really, really lucky. I think where I'm at now in my teaching career, my current administration might not love it, but I've been retired for, I don't know, six years or so now. Um, so it's kind of a non-issue. When I started, when I first started teaching, I was lucky to work for, uh, an awesome principal and vice principal. My principal was, um, a college hockey, had been a college hockey player. Uh, he really valued, you know, the role that sports could bring to a school. Um, and he, I was coaching our wrestling team there at the time as well. And not only was he supportive, but I, I was actually teaching at a rural high school outside of the city that I live in. So I would just commute out and back and forth every day. And um, man, that community in general was so super supportive. There was actually me and another teacher who we both coached the wrestling team and we were both fighting first as amateurs and then turned pro. Oh, that's and, awesome. Yeah. The community was super supportive. Like all the little towns around there that where the kids went, uh, the kids thought it was cool. The, the staff was supportive and the principal um, he's retired now. So I could tell this because he won't get in trouble, but not only did one day I, one fight, I had to fly out to the East coast to compete. And um, I didn't know how I was going to get the day off. Cause I, you know, you can only use so many personal days, can't really call in sick and then have your face on the news yeah. for, you know, <laughs> being whatever happening. So I approached my principal and, and, um, he said, well, you know, you're our wrestling coach. We have a strong wrestling team here that think that's important for our school. And, um, wrestling is connected to you know your mma career that's how you do it so yeah. it's part it's kind of all tied together so he said i'm going to give you this day uh as a day as a professional development day um oh that's great <laughs> so that's amazing yeah. right Nor normally you only get pd days you have to go to some boring seminar somewhere and learn about the new curriculum expectations that are being rolled out but i got it to go fight in a cage so that was pretty that was pretty great <laughs> um and i'm i'm sure he would have gotten in trouble about that if uh, that had ever come out while he was still around but uh, he's retired so thanks mike <laughs> <laughs> yeah no uh, that's awesome that uh, he was supportive uh, i i had mark schultz on the store on the show actually from fox catcher yeah. and when he had the one fight in the ufc uh against gary goodrich and yeah. i asked him i said you know why did you uh why did you only have the one fight did you want not want to fight anymore and he said, you know, he was over there uh, in Utah. He was coaching wrestling. They told him that if he fought again, he would not be allowed back at the school. Yeah, I think he was coaching at Brigham Young. Was he not? Was that? I, I believe so. Yeah. Yeah, because I remember reading that as well or hearing that in an interview. Um, and I, I think that I think that probably has something to do with it, too, being at a very conservative 
university uh, college, probably. Um, yeah. 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 And like, what a career that guy could have had, right? Just an amazing athlete and wrestler for sure. Oh, man. Yeah. He was, he was a monster. Yeah. But uh, great, great guy to have on the show. Your, uh, your fights, though, you never seen, uh, at least in the fights that I see listed, you never went to a decision. You had almost all submissions. One knockout. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? Um, yeah. No, no, I did. I did have an amateur fight go to a decision once, but that was in the days when record keeping wasn't good. I don't even think that probably that doesn't even show up on sure dog or tapology or anything. Um, so yeah, that was, yeah, I've only ever been to a decision once I had 12 pro fights and I think five amateur fights before that. So I, I'm not sure what's on sure dog or, or topology or exactly what's there. I know, I know for my pro record topology is the only one that has my totally accurate record on there. It's hard. It's always hard, especially in those kind of earlier days, lots of stuff just kind of flew under the radar. So. Yeah. A lot of times I go to sure dog because the format's the easiest to see, but yeah. topology does seem to, they pick up things that sure dog doesn't. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I was eight and four as a pro. I don't know if maybe sure dog has that. And I don't know, but anyways, yeah, never, never went to a decision for sure as a pro ever at all. Yeah. They, they had you at seven and four and yeah. And then I oh, seen yeah. eight and four uh, over on topology. Yeah. 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 So no decisions. I just, I don't know. <laughs> I, 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 uh, I know that some people, obviously with my wrestling background, that was my, you know, and I'm a jujitsu black belt now, um, that I, I'm going to try and take you down and, and beat you up down there. And I know people have, a, you know, some people think that grappling based fighters are, can be a little bit boring, but I was like, I'm not wasting time. I'm, I'm not going to lay on you <laughs> one way or another. I'm going to make something happen. There's going to be some, there's going to be some action. So the, I, I just think my style wasn't uh, to wait around for a decision. I did, it just, just wasn't the way I was operating. I was going to go for it. And if I made a mistake in going for it, that's, that's the way it is. Well, if they think a fighting, a fighting style is not entertaining, that, never goes to the judges uh, that they, they need to go watch kickboxing i think they're kickboxing fans and they just don't know it i say that all the time i have i have people you know kind of casual fans but like you said they're not even really mma fans because they yeah. just complain about it and i say hey guys there's this awesome other sport out there that has all <laughs> of the all of the things that you like and none of the things you don't it's called kickboxing do you know do you watch glory do you watch and what yeah. like, oh no what is that and like you can't be an MMA fan if you don't appreciate this part of it. So, yeah, nobody in the United States watches kickboxing. I don't know about Canada, but it, well, I would say it's similar, which is crazy because we've had, you know, um, Gabriel Vargas has been the Bellator and Glory 145 yeah. pound champ. Joseph Valtellini has been the Glory champ. Simon Marcus has been the Glory champ. We've had a, we've had a bunch of Canadian world champions in recent years, and it's still. And all these, you know, casual MMA fans who say they just like the stand-up game don't want to watch it. I'm like, guys, this is this is where it's at, <laughs> you know. So, yeah, and I mean, to name all those champions and uh, you know all the Canadians that have been over there, that's a pretty European-dominated sport too. So that's exactly that's at, pretty impressive. At one point, all three of those guys were living in the kind of the GTA, the Greater Toronto area, basically Toronto. Plus another guy, Matt Embry. I, I don't know if all three of those guys were champions at the same time, but for sure two of them were. And one was either on his way or had maybe just lost a belt or something like that. And Matt Embry was also fighting for the belt. He lost, but he got a title shot in glory. So we had four guys fighting for glory belts. All Oh, wow. With, all like in a really small geographic radius, you know, in Ontario. I was like, man, this is this has become the kickboxing mecca of the world which yeah generally you would think of that as you know more european but um you know a few years ago it was it was it was the place to be and, and i mean i think gabriel Vargas is even fighting this weekend again in bellator kickboxing simon marcus is definitely still around he's actually transitioning to mma he had his first mma fight he was a glory world champ he'll he 
has a win over um, Pereira, who everybody is talking about, because Pereira has a win over Adesanya. So, Simon, oh yeah, yeah, I didn't realize that. Yeah, so Simon Marcus will definitely be a guy, a Canadian guy to watch coming up. Um, very, very, very explosive athlete for sure. I'll uh, I'll put that in my betting notes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think his first fight was in a in an organization called Unified uh, FC. They're on they're on Fight Pass. They're a pretty solid organization in Canada. Um, he he fought there and fought a real real durable guy. Um, it was it was pretty one sided, but the guy survived which i was i was impressed by yeah so some guys i don't know it's like a i think a chin's kind of like power it's like either you got it or you don't and some people it's like man how are you taking this much damage and should you be taking this much damage yeah i know i i hate to talk about fighters who are like Oh, that guy's real tough. Cause I'm like, man, sometimes being a tough fighter isn't the best thing you can. I've definitely seen fighters who are too tough for their own good. Right. They just like taking a lot of unneeded punishment and stuff like that. We, um, we've got a, we've got a real tough amateur guy at our gym right now who like when you're talking about some people just have that power and yeah. man, this, this guy just, he just hits different. Like he's, he fights at 170 or 185. And, um, but when I hold, I can't hold pads for him too much. Oh, wow. Um, like I have to hold like the paddles. I don't know if you've seen the, those hip paddles. Cause yeah. if I have actual yeah. paddles, just that just makes my whole body shudder. It's kind of a, a weird thing. And, um, I was, you know, been talking with a few other people. If he, if he fights somebody at the amateur level, who's just like, maybe not as skilled as him, but real tough i'm like it could get real dangerous with with the amount of damage that this guy can do um so <laughs> i don't know what, what, what was his name again um his name is raiden oliver he's a he's an amateur he's two and oh um he uh he should be fighting in july it's too bad we've got a bunch of young guys at our gym who um kind of started getting going and then the pandemic hit so it's been two and a half almost three years of pressing pause on their careers so um you know this guy Raiden skill wise could definitely turn pro now I would say uh whether it's grappling wrestling striking he's 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 got the tools but uh, just doesn't have much cage time he's got two fights and I think both of them were you know put the guy down and out in less than a minute so just needs that experience yeah I imagine well I know that there's a lot of guys you know, trying to get in fights quickly. Now they have a big Bellator card tomorrow, actually. And yeah, you see a lot of the UFC guys that have been on the shelf for a long time because they couldn't travel or, uh, you know, whatever. But yeah, hopefully some of those guys probably lost a couple couple of years, maybe that they won't get back. But. Totally. I, we were in Ontario, so we had some of the worst most restrictive lockdowns of anywhere in the world. So it was, uh, it was a, it was a rough goal for us. At one point we had been over a, over a two year period, we had been fully open for eight weeks of the two years and we had been fully closed for 13 months. And then the, the rest of the time in between was kind of like open, but with all kinds of restrictions and regulations, which made it really difficult to do anything. Oh, wow. And, yeah so it was tough so so we you know some guys kind of and i so we were just at an event in michigan i took uh an amateur fighter down to flint michigan to compete and and we noticed a lot of guys um guys who would have fought for a few more years when everything paused they kind of just they were out of the gyms and they just kind of packed it in and then on the flip side now there's this whole new crop i've never seen so many fights where it was a lot of o and o debut fighters um against each other on like a pretty good organization um but they're just all these guys who've been waiting to fight right and and they haven't been able to fight so but they've just been honing their skills for the last two years so there were some o and o fights now where those guys were really good man real for o, o and o fighters like they just because they had they should have been fighting for the last two years but they just kind of have been on the shelf i i've noticed that just going through events same thing in boxing. Um, a lot of the, the Japanese cards, too. You've seen a lot of, even in the main card, it's like 
one and oh oh and oh versus oh and oh and it's like yeah that that makes a lot of sense though yeah um but you know i i, I won't get into people's opinions on what's going on but you know and Tar ontario uh, they actually believed in COVID. is in florida maybe <laughs> yeah. maybe yeah. it wasn't as safe we were kind of all over the place here in the states i'm yeah, it's very, very state by state, right? I know I had, I have some friends who, you know, a good friend who owns a gym in Mich Michigan, another one who owns a gym in Florida, and their, uh, <laughs> their experiences were vastly different, so. Oh, those are night and day. Yeah. Yeah, I was uh, getting, getting back into judo before I injured myself recently, and I want to get back in again, too, and uh, actually have the oldest judo school in in the United States, at least, uh, in Seattle, oh, wow. uh, that I went to for a little while and they were doing outdoors Yeah, and they did outdoors for two, uh, you know, two lessons. And then that was it. Yeah. They were uh, down for quite a, quite a bit longer. And then unfortunately I hurt myself. So I, I don't know exactly when they opened back up. Yeah. But, uh, no, it's a, it's glad to get everything back to normal and hopefully hopefully yeah. we don't have to deal with that anymore. I know. We've had we in in Canada Ontario and Quebec has also had very similar restrictions to us. There's some a lot of gyms didn't make it and like some big name gyms, some some real legit, you know, gyms with lots of good guys and well-known coaches and they just packed up shop and that's it. So Oh wow, that's too yeah. bad. Yeah definitely is but we you know we managed to survive and we're, we're we're good now but man it really it's it's sure it was sure touch and go there for a while that's that's for sure yeah because that's what i was trying to explain to people you know as i was talking to some people at our gym which of course you know at the time it's like you're going you're working out with the mask and i know some people say it doesn't bother them i'm asthmatic it bothers me yeah but they're like, oh, why can't you, you know, go to judo or, judo or why can't they do jujitsu, you know? Oh, you wear a mask or something. It's like, there's no social distancing. You're on top of each other. <laughs> so. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, so I, I don't know if you've had COVID. I, I haven't got it so far, which is crazy. Oh, um, knock on uh, wood. Good yeah, <laughs> exactly. Like everybody that I know, even when we were open and able to train with people like my brother got it and he, you know, we had trained together on Friday. So like you say, there's no social distancing. We were sweating, breathing on each other, probably bleeding on each other, whatever. He got it. We trained on a Friday, either on the Saturday or the Sunday. He told me he got it. And I was like, oh, I'm going to get it for sure. Got yeah. tested times, didn't get it. Same thing. Another girl at our gym, she's like, oh, I got it. We had trained on a Thursday. I found out on a Saturday that she had it. You know, she just told everybody that she trained with to, just to be polite, basically like, hey, yeah just heads up and uh still never got it so i don't i don't know i don't know if i had maybe had it early and didn't know or what but anyways i seem to seem to have escaped it so far <laughs> and my wife and kid one of my kids had it still didn't get it so i i don't know what the deal is oh that's that's crazy well i mean i i hope you don't get it <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> obviously i i've heard of stories like that and it, you know, I work in retail for my regular job. So it's like I'm around customers all day, every day. I finally did end up getting it. Well, this is about four months ago now. And, and it actually hit me pretty hard because I, I work seven days a week. I, a lot of times I own a business, even though, you know, of course, I wasn't in the store while I had COVID. But yeah. I, there was still a lot of things I had to do. So for not sure. really taking a break, I ended up with pneumonia and then it did kind of yeah if it really interesting like you know obviously the the healthier you are in general the better people seem to fare but like we had um you know i know some people who got it didn't even know they had it they just got tested because somebody else in their family had it and they're like oh i have it too but the flip side we had we had a coach at our gym who's very fit pretty relatively young super healthy and he ended up in the hospital so it was like it's just, man, who knows? I, I'm, I'm sure that I'm sure 20 years from now, they're still going to be figuring out things about this, that they never, they couldn't pin down while it was going on. Oh, I'm sure. Yeah. There's been athletes. Like I've talked to uh, 
uh, Chris Lieben, I've talked to him some, and he, I don't know if you know his situation, he had, it was pretty scary with him for a while. Yeah, I did hear that. Yeah. Like yeah. he, yeah. I, I was talking to one of his uh, training partners, it's like at bedside. And, you know, one day I asked him, like, how's he doing? And he said, um, you know, we're, we're making final decisions. He's most likely not going to make it. Wow. And then he just kind of like, rose like Lazarus one day he's like <laughs> he's like you're not gonna believe it he's like he's up he's talking he's and then he had a few up and downs through that but thank god he made it through yeah no kidding that's kind of kind of like feel like he fought that the way he fought his career <laughs> oh yeah he yeah he did and a lot of us um it, you know a lot of us on twitter on mma twitter changed our profile pics to you know, to him, his image, and he would, when he, you know, when he's feeling good, he'd make a little video and be like, oh, thank you, appreciate all the support, so, you know, I, I, I think that helped him, I hope it helped him, you know, seeing that people were supporting him. Yeah, it's funny that you talk about, like, the MMA community, I think um, one thing that helped a lot of gyms, um, I know for us, like, and a judo gym would be, would, or dojo would be very similar, um, when we were closed down, and all the gyms were closed down, the bigger commercial gyms where um, people didn't feel like really connected to the gym, those a lot of those gyms were the ones that actually closed because they would close and people just canceled their memberships. But we were, yeah. the one thing that floated us through was a lot of our members um, said, no, no, I'll keep my monthly fee coming out. And and I had a few people very specifically say, I want to make sure there's a gym to go back to when when we reopen. So that kind of MMA community is, is I think what, what saved a lot of MMA gyms or jujitsu gyms or, you know, judo schools or whatever, whatever it might be. So that's, that's, uh, that's definitely a, an overlooked part of the MMA world is that, is that kind of tight knit community. Uh, that's awesome. And I, I love hearing those positive stories because, you know, it seems like any time anything negative happens, seems like it's highlighted so much and it's like there's so many positive stories out there guys oh yeah so much so much so many good things going on exactly i i try to i do my best to kind of highlight those and post those if i you know if i'm on instagram and stuff like that and and kind of kind of show that side of it and um it is true I, i don't know do you know uh if you recognize the name antonio carvalho he fought in the ufc yeah yeah uh, I, yeah I, yeah i've talked to him yeah uh, so yeah. Oh yeah. He's a, he's also a friend of Ian's. That's right. Yeah. So he's a, yeah, he's a friend of mine. And he, he actually once said the, the thing that always stuck in me in my head, he said, all of the best and the worst people I know are from MMA. <laughs> and, and I said, I thought about it for a second and I said, <laughs> you know what? Yeah, that is, that's pretty accurate. <laughs> they are definitely some of the best people I've ever met. There's definitely some snakes in the grass as well. Yeah, well, and you know, I've seen some of the people that you thought might end up not being a very good person and they get an MMA or, you know, it might not be mixed martial arts, might be boxing, it might be judo or wrestling, and uh, they become a better person. It's like pretty much most of the redemption stories, I would say, you know, if like people can be redeemed that I've seen, they're pretty much all from sports. <laughs> Yeah, and I think combat sports in particular have, um, for some reason, they draw those those types of people who need that a little bit more. I think those people might not be so inclined to a team sport where they have to rely on people. You know, maybe in their in their past, people haven't been they haven't had great relationships, so they might tend to gravitate to those sports where that are individual and and you know, there's obviously an outlet for some violence basically and in, in, a, yeah. in a in a controlled way um in a, in a kind of safe environment so i think you're 100 percent right i've seen it in all kinds of sports but for sure in combat sports a lot yeah that was the thing you know that's why i got into combat sports a couple of reasons you know for one i was i was tired of being bullied i was an socially awkward kid and you know i wasn't friends with any of the people that were on the teams it was kind of a clicky school it's they, they didn't really want me there anyways, I don't feel. So I was, yeah. I was pretty happy when we got the, you know, the judo team at our school. Oh, you had a judo at your school. That's amazing. That's awesome. Yeah, it was one of, you know, I don't know how many there are in the country, but uh, I know the Kent school, Kent, Washington, that uh, 
you know, was on the other side of the state. It, the guy who ran it was my sensei, sensei, and he was, they were the first ones in the United States as far as a high school team. I don't know how many more there were. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, I just like as a, definitely some of the kids that I've taught in my lifetime that I've connected with the most are definitely kids who um, kind of like that, right? Like maybe, maybe put, maybe wrestling was the only thing that kept them coming to school or something like that. And those, those are definitely some of the kids that, um, you know, that I connected with the most. I can think of a couple kids in particular who went on to wrestling university who, you know, the idea of going to post-secondary school for them was probably probably wasn't even on their radar until wrestling yeah. came into their life. So that's, uh, I, I've seen that happen a lot of times for sure. Yeah, well, I mean, I just, I, I think that it needs to be in the school. I think it definitely needs to be in the police departments. I, that's, a, that's a whole conversation on its own. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, I know you 